Good morning. Hi, and welcome to this AHDB SEPTA Plus webinar on advances in herbicides and downy mildew control for field vegetables. I'm Dawn Teverson, and my job is to disseminate the results of research and best practice in the field veg industry. So some housekeeping before we start. You can see and hear me, but we can't hear you. You've all been muted. If you want to pose any questions during the course of this webinar, there's a question facility, which I'll explain a little later. We're timing this webinar and we're hoping to finish at about 10 past 11. And it's also being recorded so that people will be able to watch and listen again if they aren't able to join us now. For those interested in basis and neuroso points, these have been applied for and you can register for them. And I'll explain a little more in a moment. On the right hand side of my screen, there's a mock up of the control panel, which hopefully you can see on your computer. If you'd like to ask any questions, here's the question box. And you can see my mouse moving here. This is the question area. So you can type a question and submit it to us. And we'll pose those questions to the speaker after the end of the presentations. We've got three presentations today. So we're going to run through all three of those and then have a question and answer session afterwards with all three of the speakers. Basis and Neuroso points are also on here. So you can add your number here. If you can't do that or you run out of time, that's not a problem. Please email us after the event. We're recording this webinar. So for those who aren't able to join us, it will be uploaded to the AHDB website later on so that it's available to all. So on to the webinar. We've got three speakers today. Angela Huckle of ADAS, who will examine some of the products that we have been highlighted by the herbicide trials work and provide evidence on how to get the best from them. We've got Dave Kay of ADAS to look at the best performing products for downy mildew programs. And we've got Andy Richardson from Allian and Brasca Centre who gives us his suggestions on how to integrate some of the products into current IPM products programs for field vegetable crops. So as I mentioned, we'll have all three presentations We'll run through those and then we'll have a question and answer session at the end so everyone can get involved. So the first of our webinar presenters is Angela Huckle. Angela is the vegetables research consultant at ADAS, working on weed control, crop nutrition and agronomy. Angela delivers AHDB funded SEPT plus herbicide trials work on vegetable crops. She's basis and facts qualified with over 10 years experience on a range of vegetable crops. Thank you and over to Angie. I'll just unmute myself. Um, so just selecting my presentation and then I'll get underway. So uh, thank you there for that introduction, Dawn. Um, and before my main presentation, I'm just going to say a few brief words about the HDB SEPT Plus program, which is led by HDB's Joe Martin, and of which I am part of the consortium. Um, sorry, just a few. Uh, technical bits there coming up on the screen. Um, so I'm part of the consortium, as I said, and lead and coordinate the weed control work for the project, while other researchers, for example, such as Professor Rose McCollier, lead other areas of work, such as the pest work. So many of you now at all on this call, on this webinar, would now be familiar with the SEPT Plus project, which is HDB's project to find crop protection solutions to key weed, pest and disease issues in horticultural crops, which includes field vegetables. And from this infographic, you can see that 71 trials have been run over the last four years, and also the numbers of outputs or authorizations are shown there, which have been gained as a result of the work carried out in the project. The targets that were worked on over, 
over the four years in the project have been decided in conjunction with growers at meetings such as crop group panel meetings and at these meetings the HDB's risk registers have also helped inform and guide the targets by indicating where products may be lost in the near future. So this has actually led to a few emus out of the project um, such as those shown here and what I've done is highlight those in bold which are relevant to field vegetable growers. So these are ones for alliums, carrots and parsnips and brassicas. And there are also more um, in the pipeline. Again, those relevant to field veg vegetables are highlighted in bold. But the programme is not only about conventional chemistry, there has been work as well, screening for the bioprotectants and work on integrated crop management too within the programme. And those have been trialled in the, in the trials listed here. And promising bioprotectants has been identified in each of those um, SEPTA plus work packages that are listed. And again, I've highlighted in bold those which would be relevant for vegetable growers. There's lettuce, which is a salad here, highlighted as well. Um, this is because some of the products in this downy mildew trial would also be relevant potentially to onion growers. So now I'm going to move on to the main part of my presentation, uh, which covers information on the herbicides gained or in the pipeline for onions, carrots and brassicas. This is very much an overview of newly authorised and pipeline products. So for further details after this webinar, please feel free to contact me. So I think I'm sure as many growers be aware uh, that the, with the losses of key herbicides in recent years, weed has been raised by pretty much all field vegetable growers as a very high priority for targets in work in SEPTA Plus. Therefore, over the last sort of four years, I and others have been working to find replacements for key actives which have been lost, such as ioxanil, clopofam and linuron. So what I'm going to do is, is work through onion, say onions, carrots and embrasicas. Um, for the alliums, as this work was presented at the Onion Conference in 2019, which a number of, quite a large number of people attended, I'm just going to present a couple of slides on the products gained and in the pipeline from SEPTA Plus with brief details. So Andy will speak in more detail later about immersion of the fumosate from the Allium Nebraska Centre's work. Um, so two emus were gained last year for emerger. One for bulb onions, shallots and garlic, the other for salad onions. The difference between the two being that the one for salad onions is for post-emergence application only. Um, Ethofumosate, I'll speak briefly on, was trialled in SEPTA Plus, but not in tank mixes. And from the, what I saw in the SEPTA Plus work, it does need a tank mix partner, especially because it has gaps such as field pansy in its weed spectrum. But I think it could be useful in mixes. Um, an HB9898, uh, which once authorised, and the company is aiming for authorisation this year into the UK, should be a useful pre-emergence in tank mix with Stomp Aqua to give a safer alternative to wing pea with a similar or better weed control. So I said, emergence was trialled throughout SEPTA Plus in Alliums, um, but what I'll say is it's, it was in limited situations and mainly in main season crops uh, with the post M trials where we applied the applications at later times and then those which were actually gained in the EMU authorization. Therefore, because of this, we haven't seen it in sort of either end of the year, um, so extremes. So, so uh, therefore agronomists are still gaining experience with the product in wider situations. But what I will say is, as with other allium herbicides, the occurrence and severity of crop effects is dependent on the usual factors of product rate, growth stage, and consideration of waxiness of leaves, which need to be taken into account at the time of application. So sort of think about it the same way you would as others are similar sort of looking at that low, low dose mixtures at post M. So just take into account those kind of factors. Um, and there have also been increased crop effects seen in other agronomy company trials such as those that I know Agri have been undertaking to learn about the use of the product in practical situations. And they carried out trials last year in 2020 and saw evidence of increased crop effects. And this was where Emerger was used in some sequences or mixtures, but, and the response also varied with, with onion type, such as where, whether it was a fistulosum or a sepa type. Um, what Agri observed is that there is an increased risk of crop damage from Emerger in adverse conditions, 
So that kind of thing needs to be taken into account application. And due to this, I know that Agri, Alamo Brassica Centre and many other agronomy companies are carrying out further work this year on the practical integration of emerger into programmes. And in addition to this, herbicide trials led by NIAB are being carried out in the 2021 HDB Allium Field Veg Centre work. So that's all I was going to say on onions. As I say, I've covered most of the actual key results from the SEPTA Plus outcomes in the 29 presentation, and work is ongoing in the Field Veg Centre and other agronomy trials to learn about how to use it in programmes. So now I'm going to move on to carrots and parsnips. So finding suitable alternatives for Linuron has been a key part of the SEPTA Plus programme from the start for carrot and parsnip growers. And a number of actives have gained authorization, but they each do have different attributes. Three pre emergent CMUs were gained over the course of the trial, and they're listed there. So you've got a clonifen, azoxfen, and diflofenican. And you can see that weed reduction levels varied within the different trials carried out with SEPTA Plus. And this is due to the different activity on different weed species. So there was different different mixes of weed species at the, at the different trial sites. And depending on which of those herbicides targeted the different weed spectrums, then you would get a different percentage reduction. So that kind of factor needs to be taken into account with selecting the herbicide product to use, so your weed spectrum. And then particularly with something like Flexidor, which is isoxaben, it's really only works best when there's good soil moisture. And on the next slide, we're going to detail the weed spectrums of the individual actives and discuss crop effects in more detail. So firstly, a clonifer, which is now becoming a key part of new herbicide programs for carrot and parsnip growers. This was safe on main crop carrots in the trials, just giving minor spotting. Uh, but commercially, uh, greater damage has been observed where, that, where there is heavy rainfall application on the light soil, especially again, as with onions, in, in adverse conditions or where it is mixed with modes with other actives of a similar mode of action, such as diflufenican or clobosone, which are both, which are in the group F mode of action along with the clonifen. And these work by inhibition of pigment synthesis in susceptible weeds, which causes the bleaching seen on the weeds and also sometimes on the crops. So tank mixing the actives with a similar bleaching mode of action will then increase or enhance the effect and risk to the crop. So care does need to be taken with these tank mixes and if using these kind of tank mixes to increase your weed spectrum, consider reducing product rates to mitigate against crop damage. Another mix which is used in the trials was a clonifen mix with a mitribuzin and applied post-emergence. There is often a scorch, which you can see here on the leaf tips. Um, so this yellowing and, and a necrosis at the leaf tip. But the crop recovers fairly reasonably quickly from this within about two to three weeks and grows through the effect. I think you know, it needs to be grown sort of well to get through these effects as well. It's something to take into account. Moving into the use of Flexidor, this is a balancing act between crop safety and efficacy with this product. It does require moisture to work well, which and incre this increases activity on weed control, but this also does increase at the same time the risk to the carrot or parsnip crop. And in trials, we've actually seen crop loss after heavy rain. Um, and this risk is increased further on coarse textured light soils. So that's something to consider when using that one, or if you wish to use it. Diflofenican is another product, which is also on the margins of crop safety. So in the first septa plus trials back in 2017, it was included at 0.2 litres a hectare, which you can see on this picture on the top right. And you can see there, there's patches of crop loss. But if you reduce the rate to 0.1 litres a hectare, then this is a safer, to the crop here. But it does show that how much that we just on that margin there. But it does give useful control of polygonums such as red shank and has some activity on black bindweed, which is becoming an increasing problem. So it's useful in a mix in those situations. It typically causes an intervein or whitening. There's like a totally fed it, I say it's its action is inhibiting um, pigment synthesis. So you'll see, if you could just make out there, there's some whitening, intervein or whitening, and that there, but it will grow through those. And again, for clomazone, it's another active with this mode of action. And anemia was gained for post emergence use in 2018 as part of the SEPTA Plus trials to aid control of ground soil. 
One thing to note with this, uh, with clomazone, is if you apply it after, if you have heavy rain after application, it will cause a bleaching on the leaf tips. And this photo is from the 2018 trials, um, so where we had heavy rain after application, and you could pick out the plots by the white leaf tips in, in each of the, uh, amongst the rest of the trial. However, I say, despite all these authorizations, there is still a gap in volunteer potato control as the previous actives that I've described all have weaknesses in control of Solanum species. And after two years of trials, the most promising treatments have been taken forward into tank mixes for 2020. Um, so we worked with this with vegetable consultancy services. So I to thank um, James and the team for the work they've carried out on these trials because they did all the applications and all the assessments and we some very good trials there. And as you can see, there's some clear differences in effects on the potatoes from the trials here. So you've got the carrot site on the left there and the parsnip site on the right. And you can see there's, there's some quite some differences there between the size of the potatoes. These were drilled in in mid-May and the photos, these photos were taken about two months later, about two to four days after the final herbicide application. So this slide shows the trial layout of the five by two meter plots. So what we did was, well, what VCS did was plant potatoes into the plots after the crops were drilled to ensure that we had even and comparable numbers of potatoes to assess in each plot. And this also meant we could choose varieties to compare the response to the herbicide mixes and products from indeterminate and determinate potatoes. So we have Annabelle at the back of the plot, which is a determinate variety and then Marquis at the front, which is an indeterminate variety, and what proves somewhat harder to control or suppress throughout the trial. So in these trials, um, we looked at various tank mixes of the five main products, uh, Senkorex Flow, Hurricane Star Rain, and two coded products. And most treatments also included the adjuvant Validate, which VCS has identified as being useful in mixes for increasing effects on potatoes. So of these trialed, most of these have been trialed in the past couple of years and appeared promising enough to bring forward. However, new to for 2020, we had 9822. So as well as including in the mixes with the other products, uh, which were based mainly around Hurricane and Star Rain, we also included this on its own with Validate and the Senkorex Flow. So what the aim was this, was to look at suitability of the products, which we found promising in sort of commercial with commercially available products. And for the treatment list for the parsnip trial was largely the same as the carrots, with the exception that we took out the Senkorex due to its phytotoxicity to parsnips. For both trials, we based the timing of the treatment applications on the growth stage of the potatoes rather than the crop, with the first treatment applied when the potato foliage formed a small rosette and the second and final treatment applied 12 days later. And all treatments were applied at 400 leaves a hectare water volume with each trial being made up of three replicates. So I'm just going to move on now to some photos for the trials and crop effects and effects on the potatoes. So what I'm concentrating on here for this presentation is products where authorization is being pursued. So therefore so Hurricane SC and Star Rain. So so in this slide, what I've also included is the untreated control on the left. So you can see the effect on the crop and the potatoes as a comparison to the different mix. So what we've got here is the Validate Hurricane Star Rain mix. And these photos were taken two days after the final application. What you can see is that the indeterminate marquees at the front are quite heavily suppressed, but not actually dead. Um, and there's a the reasonable sort of kill on some of the indeterminate potatoes at the back but there's one or two still remaining there. And what we can also see if we compare it to the untreated control just about is that the uh, crop itself is checked or slightly shorter in the close-up photo we've got here on the right, you can observe that the crop is exhibiting that typical hurricane bleaching. So this, this is promising. There's moderate suppression of the indeterminate potatoes and a reasonable kill on the determinate potatoes with this validate hurricane Senkorex mix. But now if we move on to star rain, and I'll just show some photos here of the effect that the star rain itself has on the crop first. 
So this is examples of where styrene was included in the mix and it causes the foliage to curl and distort because of this mode of action. Um, and even though other herbicides are included in these mixes, so you've got validate hurricane styrene, the styrene with the coded product and validate, then it's mainly the styrene that's causing this dramatic effect, not the other ones. But despite this effect, four weeks after the first application, so about sort of two, three weeks after the final application, the treated plots do recover from this and start to grow back normally. Um, and it was also trialed in 20, loaded 2019, the crop fully recovered there from the distortion. So this is just sort of learning it in trials, but it does look like, the, although this is quite dramatic, the crop can grow out of it. Now these plots show styrene in a mix with Sencorex and Validate, and if styrene is authorised later in 2021, um, this is a potential mix which could be used for volunteer potato control or potential promise to. Again, you see the distorting effect on the crop. You can really see how the foliage is much curled up in this middle photo compared to the left photo. But you can also see that the indeterminate marquees at the front of the plot are very severely stunted, much more than the hurricane validate mix, Senkorex mix. And the Annabelle at the back, I think, have actually been killed outright killed the determinate potatoes. As well as the distortion of the carrot foliage, the close-up photo again shows that the Sencorex adds an additional scorched from the from this tank mix. But again, the foliage had recovered within a month after application. Now if we look at some photos from the parsnip trials, so we didn't have the Sencorex in this trial, so we've got Validate and Hurricane alone, and then we've got Validate, Hurricane and Star Rain together. We can observe similar bleaching for the hurricane and also distortion from the star rain and a check to the crop. But it also shows that while hurricane slightly checks potatoes in this trial, it's not effective alone fully to kill the potatoes and requires star rain as a tank mix partner to kill the potatoes. And these photos were taken four days after the second application was applied. Just waiting for the photo there to come up. So these these are just close-ups of the effects of the star rain on the parsnip foliage. Um, so it's, it sees it's caused it to fold down. It does take the parsnips longer to recover from from the effects, but they had sort of recovered with sort of about a month after application. And what I've got in the next slide is some photos from the 2019 trials where. We were building up to these trials and used star rain high load alone at 0.2 litres a hectare. So two weeks after, you could just about see there, you've still got the folded leaves up from after the application, but the new leaves are starting to grow better through it. By six weeks after the application, you've got a quite healthy looking parsnip crop there. So, so we're just learning about this in trials, but I think star rain and hurricane do look promising for the future. So just to sum up, all treatments were below the acceptable damage threshold um, deemed by the trials at four weeks after the first application for carrots and six weeks after the first application for parsnips. And I think with the exception of Validate and Hurricane, there's quite some sort of promising treatment combinations in the trials um, with the determinate, with gaining some kill on the determinate potatoes, uh, probably severe but less effects on the indeterminate potatoes. So as part of this project, the authorizations for star rain high load and hurricane SC are being progressed um, with the star rain high load application in combination with the Scandinavian data. So we're hoping that that will come out later this year or at least next year. And one thing I didn't for moving on to brassicas, although I've moved on to the slide, one thing I should say, we did actually also, or VCS assessed um, effects on the root deformation of root quality by looking at um, crop hairs and fanging. And there was no significant increase in those in, in any of the treated plots. So now I'll move on to brassicas. And what we've done is, is part of Septa Plus is carried out three years of herbicide screening on cauliflower. And also because of the AHDB field veg centers we've been able to trial the promising products over other brassicas such as collards, sprouts and kale. So this is in Lincolnshire and Scotland. Um, so the screening highlighted four products with promise, uh, and these range from residuals to contact acting herbicides, 
but for the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to concentrate on those closer to authorization, which are HDB 9840 and HDB 9887. So HDB 9840 has been put forward for residue testing and has proved safe to nearly all brassicas in the trial at 0.75 litres a hectare. Um, so the heads are marketable, but because of the way it acts, it does cause distortion of outer leaves. The only exception to its safety is sprouts, where it causes bolting, and I'll show a picture of that later. And then we've got HDB 9987 and 9875, which are a rating registration in the UK, where the company hopes to gain registration this year, and then HDB are in discussion to pursue EMUs once it's registered and residues. So if we just look at the results in the 2020 trial on cauliflowers in links, so this is weed control, so you've got percentage weed cover on the left axis and the treatments here on the bottom axis. So the red arrows highlight the two products in the pipeline. And the purple arrow is 9875, which as you can see here, so it's one of the third most effective herbicides in the trial, but it's a little bit behind 9987, but I thought I'd highlight it here as it's sort of one that's due to come out and it could be very useful. But if we consider 9840, the dashed red arrows, so this one and this one, this can you can see here clearly the 0.75 litre hectare, hectare rate of efficacy is increased as the control of chickweed and red shank is increased at this high rate to give a significant control of overall weed levels. And was and this was only used alone at a month after planting and has been probably the second best treatment in the trial. The other active in the pipeline highlighted by the solid red arrows is HDB 9987. So we applied this alone here or with gamut 36 CS. Alone, it does reduce weed and it had a significant reduction in fat hen and also reduced mayweed, um, but it doesn't control a full weed spectrum alone. So it does need a tank to its partner. And if you can see here where it was reduced to half rate and applied with gamut 36 CS, it was what gave one of the best weed control in the trial. And I think, this could sort of fit in the same place as metastasis claw does with gamut. So sort of soon after post planting. So just a little bit now, just about the, these two herbicides. So because they're coded, um, HDB 9987. So the activity of this is a residual herbicide and it, and it is ineffective once the weeds have emerged. So you can see here in these pictures, which were taken at the Scottish trials, this was relatively dry application. Another thing, it does require moisture to work well. So I think you would actually see more weed kill here of the, of the fat hen if there was more moisture application, but it's done a reasonable job when you look at the untreated, whether the amount of fat hen you've got there. So it's redu significantly reduced the weed levels. But if you then apply it post weed emergence, so this was applied post planting and the weeds emerged, it really does reduce, very much reduce the efficacy of it. So it needs to be, put on before weed emerges and have decent moisture present. If those parameters are there, it can give good control of grasses, fat hen, mayweed, speedwell, cranesbill, groundsel, cleavers and poppy. So it's got a good, good range of, of um, weed species there. So before the previous, you saw in the graphs, I think with a tank mix partner, it does need one to fill in those gaps. And if you reduce it to half rate in a cloma zone, it just give very good weed control. So, this is a chloracetamide product, so it is in the same family as dimethenrepi and propochlor. And as well as myself, Kathy has been working on this in the previous project. And the final herbicide is HDB9840. So this is a co-formulated contact herbicide. Um, so it's a synthetic auxin, so similar to fluoxepar, and affects growth and cell division. Hence, it creates a distorted growth in the weeds, uh, which also gives a little bit of distortion, I think, in some of the brassica crops. So this needs to be applied when weeds are growing actively, such as like Fluoxapar does. And this particular product is effective on the susceptible weeds up to five centimeters high, but avoid prying it when crops are stressed. And you can, I've marked here the plot where it's been applied. So it's easy, it's good reasonable weed control. These are some of the crop effects I saw in the different trials we've had. As I said, you can see that the heads are actually quite marketable, so the broccoli and the collards, but you are getting a distortion in the veins of the leaves, and the outer leaves around the plants. And in the kale, this does give a sort of increased thickened veining, but if shredded, I don't think we'd notice that. But because the heads are marketable, 
then we've sort of put this forward for residues and authorization. Sprouts, however, are a different um, kettle of fish. And you can see early on, we got quite a lot of distortion applied over the plants and then also bolting about 12 weeks after application. So decided it's not one really for sprout crops. So just to sum up, and there's a lot in there to go through, these are the recent emus which were gained as part of the project. So for alliums, we've got emerger and for carrots, there's those four products there, which have been gained throughout the Scepter Plus project. But there's also more in progress. So for each of the crops, there's two more products in progress. And further down the line from that, there's also at least for each of the allium carrot brassicas, something else, another coded product, which can be pursued out of this work that we've done. So I should just move to, because um, I'm aware I'm running over. There, I move to the um, thank those people who've carried out the trials, been involved in the trials, and just you know generally collaborated to pull all this work together and get all these EVs through. And I think I should also mention um, Kathy not at this point because a lot of the early work was done by Kathy and has been based on, and I've been able to build on that work to bring through all these these emus. So uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Angela. And um, in the interest of getting on um, and keeping an eye on the time, I will now introduce our sub second speaker, who's Dave Kay from ADAS Horticulture. Dave is a plant pathologist. He's working at AHDB Horticulture, as I mentioned, working across all sectors of horticulture. He had a, has a broad understanding of crop pathogens and their inter interaction with different growing systems. Recent AHDB funded research includes several sector plus projects on downy mildew, in onion, as well as ongoing seed treatment work in leek, cauliflower and spinach. Other types of work include the production of reviews, fact sheets and case studies. Thanks and over to you, Dave. Thank you, Dawn. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, as Dawn said, my name's Dave Kay, and I'm a plant pathologist with RSK ADAS Horticulture. And um, today I'm going to talk to you about the best performing downy mildew control products for IPM programs. Um, I'm going to talk about the outputs from the SEPTA Plus trials, uh, disease trials, as Ange did for the herbicide work. So I thought it'd be good to start with an introduction as to what downy mildew is. So it's an oomycete um, pathogen and um, also known as water molds. So they're fungus-like, but they're not true fungi. Um, the main difference is their cell wall contains cellulose and glucan, whereas um, fungi contain chitin. And what that means is because they've got a different makeup, um, there's different products which are required and different activities to, to treat them. They belong to the order Peronospirales, and they're obligate parasites of many species of plants, which you'll all be aware of. Um, and this means that they need a living host um, in order to complete their life cycle. They're the disease of seedlings and mature plants, so they can be a big problem when, apply, when um, causing damping off in um, at seedling production. However, they can affect plants all the way up to harvest. As you can see in the image there, there's some downy mildew and cauliflower. So it's important that we have effective control from the very beginnings of production right through to harvest. And there's several examples of downy mildew species, um, including Peronospora destructa, which affects alliums, Peronospora parasitica subspecies brassicae, which affect brassica species such as cauliflower, and then Brumia lactuki, which affect lettuce species. And once the pathogen's invaded um, under kind of wet, cool, moist conditions, you get internal browning, and then you get white fuzzy lesions often followed by spore release, and then these spores spread um, and the cycle starts all over again. So I decided to have a look at the chemistry that was available for vegetable crops already, just to put it into perspective. So there's currently about 15 active ingredients available for vegetable cropping. However, there's so many different vegetable crops that it's not 15 for all, they're spread amongst all the different crop types. Um, and many of these rely on mancozeb. And so um, last year, the EU government agreed on a non-renewal of mancozeb in October 2020. Um, and what was originally a three month um, three plus three month grace period, it's been extended to six plus six month grace period. But at the moment, it looks like 
we might be losing Mancazeb. Um, and this is going to cause a, <coughs> an issue for a few of the products we use, including things like Dithane, um, which is Manka substrate, Invader, which contains Manka and Dimethamorph, Fubal Gold, which is Manka and Metal XLM, and Valbon, Manka and Ben Fire Valid Carbisopropyl. I'd like to add that um, Metal XLM was also um, renewed recently. But that has some restrictions on seed treatments if you're using it in that in that way. So there's been three SEPTA Plus projects specifically looking at downy mildew um, with reference to vegetable crops. One on alliums, which is done by ADAS, and then two more, one on brassica propagation and one on downy mildew and lettuce, um, both done by Stockbridge Technology Centre, Kirsty Wright there. Um, although lettuce may not be considered a vegetable crop, the lessons that we learn from that are applicable for, for vegetables, as Angela said. Um, we've tried 27 different products, um, and that includes 23 active ingredients, which is fantastic considering, as I just said, there are only about 15 available currently for vegetable crops. Um, and 13 of these are new actives for downy mildew control in vegetables. So some of them will be already used in other areas of vegetable cropping and we're trying them in different crops, the 13 are, are brand new to vegetable cropping. And that represents 17 different frac groups, um, which is so important for resistance management. So we don't just trial the same mode of action each time, we make sure we have a broad swathe of, of active ingredients and um, frac groups to try. So as I said, I'll be talking about three projects and I'll start with Sceptre Plus Project 54, Downy Mildew Control on Alliums. Um, the main aim of this project is to investigate alternatives to Invader, Mancazeb and Dimethamorph, um, mainly the Mancazeb component really. Um, and this was done in an artificially inoculated commercial trial in, in Warwickshire on the salad onion variety Yoda. And um, we looked at eight treatments um, and then we compared that with the entry to control, receiving no treatment, just water, as well as a industry standard program, which was Amistar, Fubal Gold, Infinito, and Invader. And all products were applied um, five times um, in straight programs. So it's not something that you yourselves would do, it would be against um, resistance management guidance. However, by doing it, it allows us to really um, check its efficacy as well as see if there's any phytotoxicity um, concerns. And this is a graph of the results for that trial. Um, so orange bars or pink bars, however it appears on your screen, um, they indicate um, results which are significantly better than the untreated control. And this graph shows the degree of control of downy mildew severity. So if we look at the first bar, the industry standard program, that gave 65% control of downy mildew compared to the untreated. Um, and as you can see, all products did very well, actually, apart from 9842A, the blue bar there. Um, and there were three kind of standout products, which I would like to mention. And I do apologize for the codes that are here. Um, unfortunately, they're unavoidable, but I'm trying to keep them to a minimum where I can. So AHTV 9827 did very well. Um, that's a single active, but that active is used in combination with another product in a downy mildew um, control product, which is used in peas. So we anticipated it would be effective. Um, 9862 is a new generation A's also, that also gave about 80% control. And that product um, I think is being considered for an EMU. Um, and I think we, we, they just need residue data on that. So that's maybe a few years away, but that's um, hopefully in the process of coming. And then the final bar on the far right, which also gave 80% control was oxythiopiprolin. And, um, and also that was applied with the adjuvant phase two. And the reason I'm able to name this product or this active is because it's been authorized. So um, it was actually authorized on label. So Arondis Plus it's called, um, Oxfire Piprolin. It's an OSBPPI fungicide, FAT code 49. Um, and it is now authorized for outdoor bulb any and garlic, potato and shallot for downy mildew control. Um, unlike myself or, or if who did the work, who applied it three times per, uh, five times per crop, it has a maximum application of three times per crop with a seven day harvest interval. But it's a really powerful fungicide from the results we've seen. And it's got some great attributes. It's preventative, 
it has translaminar activity, it's got um, residual, curative and eradicative properties, as well as antispirulant activity. So it, it's an all-rounder and um, yeah, a really useful tool which is now available to you. And at the same time, I believe another product, Zorvec Endavia, which is then Thiovalicarb, as well as Oxithiopipilin, um, was released. Um, and that will also probably have enhanced control. However, we haven't tried that um, myself in the Septa Plus work, but it's likely to also be a, a valuable new option available to you. Moving on to the second project, um, down emergency control in brassica propagation. As I said um, at the start of this, this um, presentation, outbreaks um, in young seedlings or young plants can be uh, can devastate them. So the aim of this project was to identify the best um, products which are currently available and also look at alternative actives to treat downy mildew at transplant. And this was done at Stockbridge in a modular experiment in the susceptible variety graffiti. And they trialed nine treatments against downy mildew and they included Parat, Infinito and Proplant as well as um, uh, anonymized test products. And the trial plots each received up to six applications of test products, again in straight programs, so we can tease out results, but um, not all of them had six applications. That was based on the recommendation from the label. And these are the results. So this table is quite similar to that last graph I showed you. So the orange pink um, cells represent significant differences from the untreated control. Um, so in the first column, you can see that um, Infinito reduced um, downy mildew leaf spots <coughs> on brassica seedlings by 88.5%. Um, so looking at this table, you can actually see very interestingly, Parat um, is all blue in that row, which means that they didn't give significant decreases in uh, downy mildew severity or downy mildew leaf spots. Um, and this was quite surprising. However, the reason behind this is that they believe um, that the isolate they used may have had lower sensitivity or even resistance um, against um, parrot. So I'm not saying all um, parrot is, is useless. I'm not saying that at all. But if you are noticing um, reductions in the efficacy of parrot or you're using parrot, it might be worth just um, keeping an eye on it and, and just seeing um, if you are seeing any any reduced efficacy in your programs. Unsurprisingly, Infinito did very well, as did Proplant, apart from a bit of a blip at the second assessment. AH to be 9941, um, that gave good control. And actually, this product was used in Down in Mildred and Onion. So going back to that slide, you can see the highlighted one with the asterisk gave about 60% control in Down in Mildred in, in Salad Onion. Um, and we had about 60% control at the first and final assessment here with, with that blip in the middle. Uh, commodity substance 9880 had no effect. Um, the final four products, and again, I apologize for the codes. Um, these all performed fantastically well. Um, and most of them already used against downy mildew or phytophthoras in other crops such as potatoes and salad. So we expect them to do well. And as Ange mentioned in the introductory slides, there are a couple of products which are already in the process for emus. Um, and so these might be included in that. So although I can't name these products and they're not out available now, it doesn't mean that there aren't products coming through in the future. Going on to the final trial, um, down in mildew and lettuce, again, stock bridge, model crop approach so we can draw conclusions over to vegetable crops. Eight treatments were trialed in this, each was again receiving up to six applications, um, but dependent on label recommendations in straight programs. And this included um, defense solicitor project products, which require a few applications before pathogen challenge. And all products in this trial were applied as protectants, apart from 9958 and 9959, which were applied curatively. However, they're not curative products, but unfortunately they came late, um, so were applied at this time. And looking at this table again, same as the last table. However, the way these were assessed was based on um, 0 to 5, so it was it was a range. 
And so higher numbers are bad, higher numbers are, are greater disease severity, so the, so the lower numbers are the better. And again, pink, orange cells represent those significant differences. And the standard program, which was Fubal Gold, um, um, Parrot and Revis all very well, as expected. And then the next two products, 9959 and 9958, they were applied late. But um, although they're protectants, they did have some eradicant um, activity, which wasn't listed on the label. So that's positive, but it's likely we would have seen even better results had they been applied preventatively. But the results we saw weren't bad. Um, one issue with AHDB 9958 was phytotoxicity. So it might be that if we can um, bring this product over to vegetable crops, it would have to be tested for phytotoxic um, effects. 9963 was also good. Oh, sorry, um, 9958 had phytotoxic effect. Oh, yeah, I just mentioned that. 9963 gave really good control. Um, however, it left a residue. But um, so if that is authorized, maybe that needs to be applied early, but um, still a useful, useful product if it gets authorized. And then 9962, um, that was tested in the Brassica trial. And that is a new mode of action and that gave good control. So another good product. Um, as with 9961 and 9960, we also saw, saw positive control. And then the final two products were the defense inducers I just mentioned. And because they need multiple applications before challenge, we can see that 9957 gave good results um, initially, but it's likely that the level of disease um, got too high for it to actually um, compensate or control um, through the up, up regulated defense pathways. But you know, you wouldn't use a defense solicitor by itself. You'd always use it in combination with other products. And so it, it might be useful for at the start of a, of a program or to enhance or extend um, spray intervals. So it could be a useful um, contribution. Um, however, the second defense inducer didn't actually provide any, any um, protection in this work. So in conclusion, Septoplus fungicide trials have demonstrated the effectiveness and crop safety of 27 different fungicides against down in mildew and onion brassica transplants and lettuce when used as a model crop. And the Rondis Plus Oxifier Piprolin is now available for use for you on label on outdoor bulb, onion, garlic, lettuce, potato and shallot for down in mildew control. And as we've seen, several products were effective against downy mildew in individual trials. And then 9962 and 9941 performed well in the two trials that they were in, which confirms their efficacy, which is always nice. Um, however, many products have shown good efficacy. And although you don't have them now, um, that data is there. There's work going on in the background and hopefully more um, useful emus will be um, come through in, in the near future. And in the meantime, Septoplus and other AHDB funded projects will continue to go forwards and identify new products um, for you. Finally, I'd just like to mention a few acknowledgements, of course, to AHDB Horticulture and the Agrichem companies who support this project and fund it, to the host grower of the Onion Trial, and to Stockbridge Technology Centre for the work they did there, and that's Kirsty Wright and her team. And then ADAS colleagues, Aoife O'Driscoll, who actually led this work originally, Richard Hackett, and then Phil Langley, who was also involved in some of the onion assessments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, and in the interest of, of time, we'll crack on. Um, a lot of useful stuff there. Thank you very much. So our next speaker is Andy Richardson. He's Managing Director of Allium and Brassica Agronomy and has worked as an agronomist in the horticultural industry for over 30 years. He's technical director for the Brassica Growers Association and works closely with manufacturers and a, the AHDB in securing new product approvals for the Brassica industry. Great, thanks very much and over to you Andy. Uh, thanks Dawn and uh, good morning uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'll and keep us on time so I'll try and finish just after 11 to give a to give plenty of time for, for questions. Um, I'd like to thank Dawn and the HDB for giving uh, me uh, just a humble onion and cabbage agronomist the opportunity to speak to you uh, today. I think we've seen from Dave and Angela's talks earlier this morning there's a lot of great work 
uh, going on in, in Sceptre Plus, 71 different trials, 50 different crops over the past four years. There's absolutely no way I've got time to run through everything that's been going on the project in just 15 minutes or so. So somewhat selfishly, uh, I picked out a few of my bulb onion and brassica highlights uh, to give you a taste of what's going on uh, with regard to weed pest and disease control and hopefully get across to you how essential this work is and indeed I think will continue to be uh, for the competitiveness of our industry for years to, for years to come. Uh, before I start, hopefully you'll understand the requirement for products to be uh, to be to be coded. Uh, it's primarily to provide anonymity to the manufacturer who otherwise uh, may not want to put their products uh, into Scepter, into Scepter Plus. The vast majority of products that we're trialing or that are being trialed under Scepter Plus are in crops and situations that the manufacturer never envisaged. So you can understand, uh, you understand their nervousness uh, somewhat. In my talk today, I've tried to focus on products that are recently approved or are pretty close to approval. So I will talk quite a lot about product names, many which you've heard before uh, in Dave's and, and Angie's talks. I will also mention a few products um, that I can't name, um, but I'll mention them because they're absolutely stand out in terms of their performance and they're a definite AHDB target uh, for, new, uh, for new approvals. I think of all the sectors, herbicides have been hit hardest uh, by recent approval uh, losses in bulb onions, as, as Angie was saying, we've lost uh, Intruder, Chlorprofan, we've lost Pyramine, Chloridazin last year, and we'll lose Bromoxanil this coming September, as well as a whole heap of active ingredients lost uh, in sort of five, eight years uh, before that. So it was really great for us to have uh, Clonifen or Emerger approved uh, in April uh, this year. Uh, for those of you that uh, haven't used it, Emerger is a residual herbicide. Uh, really good for control of weeds such as mayweeds, fat hen, pansy and red shank and pansy for me is, is a particular particular nightmare. It can be used pre-emergence but where there are you can potentially get some issues with pre-emergence use particularly on onions and as Andrew was saying particularly if you get heavy rain, uh, heavy rain beforehand. So we found it most safe to use and most effective to use uh, post-emergence. Um, rates such as 0.1 from post crook um, or uh, in mixtures with bromoxynil or 0.2 from the half a true leaf growth stage in tank mixes with either bromoxynil or fluoxypire would be pretty effective uh, in taking out things like fat hen and some of the some of the polygonous weeds. We're using sort of higher rates of sort of 0.3 uh, from one true leaf and again using that in combination with uh, low doses of pentazone, uh, pyridate, fluoxypore, so bazagran, lentigran and starain really good for control of uh, fat hen and field pansy and both these weeds have become more challenging because of loss of linuron uh, since the loss of linuron in 2018. As Andrew was saying there are potentially issues uh, with crop safety and the key thing as with all onion herbicides is to check crop wax and condition before you before you apply. Angie showed a nice picture of bleaching on carrot leaves and this is sort of bleaching effect. Let's put that on to uh, point of options, get a laser pointer. So this is sort of bleaching effect that we see on, on onions. That's application when the crop was a little bit a little bit de-waxed. Looks a bit funny but it does soon fairly quickly uh, fairly quickly grow out of it. Andrew has also uh, talked to you talked to you very quickly about uh, fofumisate effect. Um, which has gone through uh, Sceptre Plus trials. Um, we've used effect uh, in combination from post-crook stage with wing pea and bromoxynil, our sort of typical uh, typical treatments at that sort of stage, and we've had no uh, ill effects from using from using effect. Also, again, repeat applications at, at half a true leaf. Again, we've been pre bromoxynil, and we've seen no phytotoxic effect from it. And I think we've certainly seen improved control, of, particularly of polygonums, from adding it into program. So hopefully that approval will come through later uh, later this year. And then on brassicas, uh, Angie talked to you about um, 9840, which has been really, really promising. A contact herbicide on brassica crops is desperately needed. And the minute we've got two, uh, clopyrrolid, uh, Dow Shield if you like, and pyridate lentigran, lentigran goes at the end of this year. So we're gonna have a real gap in our programs uh, for post stem control and, and 9840 shows real promise. Uh, I think particularly as, as again as Angie said for nightshade, groundsel, 
Klebus, Fumatry and Mayweeds. And, and I know the HDB are working pretty closely with the manufacturer to try and bring this approval through over the next couple of next couple of years. One thing Angelo and, and Dave didn't talk about um, was uh, was pests. Um, and for a brassica grower, uh, aphid control is going to be one of the challenging, more challenging aspects we have in terms of weed pests and disease control. So aphids are going to be a real issue potentially uh, this coming year. And, and obviously that also extends to, uh, to salad crops. Uh, over the last few years, we've lost perimicarb, uh, aphox, pymetrazine, plenum, thiamethoxam, cruiser, and thioclopid or biscaya actually loses its approval tomorrow. And this has left a pretty big hole uh, in our armory. So crops such as cauliflower, broccoli, and kale now only have one approved active for aphid control. That's spirotetramat mavente. Although we fare a bit better on the longer season brassica crops, um, with sprouts and cabbage, both have an option, so the option of using uh, folio applications of tapiki, flunicamid, and we also have insist on sprouts. This still only gives us, in the case of cabbage, four sprays, or in the case of sprouts, five sprays for season-long aphid control from May to October, which is, uh, yeah, going to be an absolute challenge. It has proved really difficult to gain approvals for insecticides over recent years. However, there's a new pre-planting treatment which has shown real promise under Sector Plus. And we're hopeful that we can gain an EMU approval across the range of brassica crops. So we're not forgetting kale and collards, which always do seem to get forgotten. Um, this new module treatment sort of given us aphid control for up to a month after, after planting. And whilst I understand this not, might not sound anywhere near as good as the seed treatment, thymothoxan, which typically we get eight to 10 weeks of control, early aphid control is critical for reduction in virus spread. Turnip yellows virus in particular can reduce yields of sprouts and cabbage by 60%, as well as giving us increased symptoms of things like tip burn in stored cabbage, so internal physiological symptoms. There are also two new group four insecticides on the, uh, on, on the cards, uh, again, which will hopefully come through over the next two years. Uh, group four insecticides have had a bit of a challenging time. This broad group also includes the neonics, so hopefully um, the, the two companies involved will be able to get those products through to us because they are absolutely desperately, uh, desperately needed. Then on to these disease control. Um, Dave talked to us quite a lot about oxythiopiprolin. We have that as two products and onions. It's all the candavia, uh, which is in a mixture with Valbon and Arondis Plus, which will be oxythiopiprolin in a mixture with Amistar. We had those approved uh, last year. For control of downy mildew and they're pretty uh, pretty damn effective. Um, we do need new approvals uh, for, for bulbungins in particular. Um, the loss of Mancazeb, which um, the EU's put a date of January 2022 to revoke the approval. Um, CRD seemingly has extended this approval for th further three years for Mancazeb, uh, but personally I doubt this will I doubt this will stick. But what the, la the loss of the EU approval has done is, is had a significant impact on the availability of products such as Valbon, Invader, Fubol Gold, and of course, the straight Mancus of products. So we're desperately short of products for this coming season. So approval for Zorbeck and Arons Plus is an absolute gold standard. There is also a new cone form product, which is also so shown pro real promise in trials on a range of crops, uh, both for leaf spot control and also for downy mildew. And again, the manufacturer uh, the manufacturers and the HDB are working closely together to try and get a raft of approvals through in 2022-2023. Storage cabbage growers will know that 2019-20 uh, storage season was absolutely desperate. Uh, we store around 2,000 tonnes of cabbage ourselves in our cold stores at Curtin, and we ended up moving the crop two months earlier than normal. Um, just really due to the high levels of disease that we saw. I mean, the issues were really down to botrytis and phytophthora, uh, predominantly the result of that really, really wet 2019 autumn. And I think to cap it off in combination with that, 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 that autumn, we also lost a couple of pretty important approvals. So we lost the Prodione, Rovel in 2017, and Metal M, uh, SL567 in early 2019. With the HDB's help, we did manage to get 7 aid approved for the 18-19 season, but the exceptionally high risk 
high disease risk we had last season defeated it somewhat. So this season, uh, we've got both uh, residue trials ongoing for the approval of a new HDHI, and hopefully that will be through in time for this autumn. Um, those trials are ongoing. We've got um, samples in, in our stores and also uh, had help from a local grower who's also storing uh, samples. We've also got efficacy trials uh, ongoing, again, in our stores, looking at uh, a range of new conventional and biological fungicides for the control of both Botrytis and also for Phytophthora. And I think it's some years since anybody's worked on Phytophthora. So this is quite exciting work if we can find something um, to, uh, to, to, to reduce the level that we see in stored crop. Phytophthora particularly damaging last year. So Sector Plus is really is a massive R&D programme. I think that quite rightly has taken a fairly large chunk of the grower levy over the past four years. Uh, the results of this work will take time to filter down through into new approvals. And we, we saw this with the initial SEPTA project. And I think the main reason is a somewhat slow and torturous nature at times of the approvals process. And obviously the very fluid nature of pesticide approvals at the minute uh, as, as well. There's quite a lot of uncertainty when products come out or active ingredients rather come around for a re-registration um, if they will make it through that process uh, or not. I also think in the short term, the whole approvals process is unlikely to be helped uh, by, by Brexit. You know, there's quite a lot of change happening in, in, in CRD. However, myself and a number of the manufacturers have a fairly positive view of CRD. And I think once the new processes get ironed out, uh, we feel that it should be much easier and faster to gain approvals in the UK rather than under the old uh, EU, EU system. I think all that being said, Sector Plus results to date are pretty impressive. Um, so far, we have 21 new approvals, as well as 49 new applications for approvals currently sitting with, with CRD. So it's a pretty good, pretty good start. I think that's where I'd like to, to end and hand back to uh, hand back to Dawn. Hopefully we've still got plenty of time for questions, Dawn. Well, I hope so. And thank you very much for that. That was really helpful. Um, I'd like to invite all the speakers, please, to put your cameras on and um, then we can all take some questions. We've we've got enough time. We've, those were excellent presentations. Thank you. Um, We've got one from um, Gary here. Dave, hi. With forthcoming loss of Mancozeb, has any work been done anywhere on another protective fungicide, Folpet, to see if it has the same efficiency as Mancozeb? Um, not that I'm aware of in the work that I've done, um, but it might be worth um, discussing with, with uh, VHW or Joe Martin in. Um, Sept plus just to see if other work has been done on that that I'm not aware of. But um, yeah, I'm I'm aware of the work that I've been doing. But um, yeah, there might well be work on Folpet out there. I think the Folpet at the minute, correct me if I'm wrong, is is purely just on on cereal crops. So there may be a metabolism data issue moving those approvals onto onto vegetable crops. So uh, that's something I think we need investigating, Gary. Great, thank you for that. Um, I wanted to pose one question myself um, because I'm not sure everybody necessarily knows how we select um, diseases, pests, herbicides, how we select areas to work on, because obviously there's a lot of problems. Um, you know, how do we prioritize and what about working with growers from the start? Um, can we ask Angie that one, please? And then perhaps yeah. Andy could chip in. Sure. Uh, so I think I said at the start, what was put out when Sceptre Plus first um, was put together was went to the grower panels to ask those guys uh, what are their what are their key priorities they want. And as growers, there will be absolutely huge list of what's happened. So we need to we needed to whittle them down, say what was immediately needed doing first, and then and then sort of take those down. And what's helped in the last couple of years is HDB's put forward a risk register. So that highlights products which are going. So you can kind of see gaps as well, which we've also had at the crop grower meetings. So, yeah, I think 
there's, there's a lot of talk between the industry and ourselves as a consortium to to de define what we look at and there has to be something to test i mean that's something that some there might be something that's a pressing issue but there's actually nothing coming through for it at that point so there's been a rationalization as well if, if that makes if that helps to explain a little bit yeah and we've we've done the sector plus trials but also there's been extra trials um in strategic centers do you want to just um mention those a little yeah so uh what we've done there was because that's going to be more near near market products is to look at the most promising ones that are coming through working with growers and, and who are on parts you know in those part of groups and panels and have, have been happy to host and keen to host really because they want to see them come through too and i think oh, andy sits on on the brassica and onion panel so he's also privy to see how that works with the selection of pest and disease and and how this comes in because there's the onion uh center as well which is now going to do i think work on herbicides coming to yeah. this year yeah it, this year will be the second year that onions are doing um herbicide trials so storage cabbage um we've we've got in lincolnshire um andy do you want to just um say how we came to be doing those trials uh yeah i think a lot of storage cabbage growers moaned at us <laughs> <laughs> and quite rightly so really absolutely um, you know we we, we it, it's always a difficult crop and these post harvest applications of fungicides are always um, always a challenge to to gain approval uh, to gain approval for um, so you know when we when we lost um, those two products some some three years ago and and uh, two years ago, in effect, it left a massive hole. You know, as a as a uh, as as a company storing cabbage, you know our losses went from typically somewhere around about forty percent uh, in June uh, to in excess of sixty percent. So we were throwing more than half the cabbage that we stored uh, away uh, last last spring. Um, uh, and that's pretty, pretty, pretty devastating. You know, you spend all the money harvest, all the money growing it, all the money harvest it, all the money storing it, and then you you end up throwing, you end up throwing up more than half of it away. Um, so you know, we thought that Serenade, uh, I mean, Serenade is a great help, and I, 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 by all means, I do not want to knock Serenade. And I think in a normal year, such as the one we've just had, where we've had better harvesting conditions, you know, it certainly works. But if you're up against it, conditions are exceptional. You know we do need to be looking at other things and i think that's why it's great that you know at least we'll hopefully have a, a pot a new product a conventional fungicide product that storage cabbage growers can use this autumn as well as the biological product uh, serenade and hopefully you know this work that uh, is currently in the store at the minute looking at new um new products will also bear fruit you know for something we could then get a gain approval for in 2022 or 2023. So it's, it's lovely to see some options coming through for, for storage cabbage growers. Great, it's it's good to see things coming through the system. Um, I think in the interest of time, it's eight minutes past 11. So um, let's try and keep to time. Um, if anybody has questions, if you're anything like me, I usually think of things just after the presentations or the questions have finished please do send them in to either me or any of our presenters i'm think i'm sure are quite happy to to have them and i'll certainly pass them on um, is there, is there sorry dawn is there time for one quick question for me if you've got nobody yeah, else yeah yeah go can, for it i haven't quite just ask, pressed the, show my screen okay <laughs> so apologies can i ask what the future is for sector plus what's going to happen with it this year and possibly into the future Great, thanks for that. Um, would Angie, would you like to answer that one? Um, sure. So, because of uh, COVID last year, we had to delay a, a, a few products. So, for this year, what's going to carry on is those products, and it's going to be completed. So, the last year was supposed to be the last year of the pro the project, um, as it is now. But so we're going to continue an extension of the year to to take finish those projects and get those targets completed. After that, um, depending on sort of how the outcome of the vote for the HDB, we are looking to perhaps combine it more into integrated crop management looking at. So combine it with the AMBER programme, which is another HDB project, which is looking at improving um, improving the performance of biopesticides. So trying to combine those two together 
Um, so the aim is to continue with the work. I think it's an important area of work getting or getting emus through, but with more of an integrated crop management and integrated pest management focus to it. Great, thanks, thanks for that. Thank you, and that's that's a good way to um, wrap up. So I'd better show my screen, do a little bit of housekeeping, and then that will be the end of our webinar. So I'll just show my screen. Okay, so let's go with that one. So thank you to all our presenters. You've, you've done a fantastic job and I only, only wish we had a bit more time to um, talk a bit more about what's been done. As I mentioned, please do um, follow up with your questions. If you haven't had time to put to your basis and neuroso points, in the system, just ping us over an email and either I, myself or Aaron will deal with that. Um, so that's great. As I said, we've any questions, just send them through. My email address is there on the screen, dawn.teverson at ahdb.org.uk. So this is being recorded and Give us a few days and that will be up on the AHDB website for anybody who may have missed it or wants to catch up on um, some of the detail that has been presented today. So this is one of a series of webinars produced by AHDB Horticulture. My colleagues are doing several other webinars, so please do keep an eye on our website for those. And so now it's just for me to say thank you very much for tuning in um, and we hope that you'll join us again soon thank you very much